welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. Today's show, we're going to catch up with our fur bear biologist as he's talking about mountain lion sightings. Then we're also going to catch up with biologists out in the panhandle as they're doing aerial surveying for pronghorns. But first, we're going to highlight a brand new program. We've partnered up with the Department of Human Services and the Oklahoma Wildlife Conservation Foundation. It's called Fostering Outdoor Oklahoma Families, and it's introducing the outdoors to some very special kids. So we're out here in uh, Oklahoma this morning. And so uh, we decided to surprise a few kids this weekend and, and bring them out here to uh, my place in uh, Johnston County. Do a little bass fishing today and, and teach these kids how to flay their bass if they want to and cook them up. We're gonna cook them right here on the bank here and it's gonna be a lot of fun. You know, this morning I gotta admit I was a little bit nervous because, uh, you know, invited people out to the ranch that I'd never met before. And I knew it was for a great cause. I knew that uh, this was something that's very important, but it wasn't until uh, that moment where, you know, the cars were starting to come out of the, the woods and they were coming across the pond levee that I really got kind of nervous. I was like, what's this day gonna be like? Are the fish gonna bite? Are these kids gonna be into it? Are, the, are they gonna be more concerned with me because uh, I'm on TV, I'm on the radio? And come to find out, you know, I don't know if we just got lucky today, but, we had four kids here that, yeah, you're Blake, good to meet you. I gotta go fishing, see you later. That made me so happy. My name is Justin Brown, the director for the Oklahoma Department of Human Services, and I'm cabinet secretary for Human Services and Early Childhood Initiatives. The Department of Human Services runs the foster care and adoption program for the state of Oklahoma. So at any one time, there are about 7,700 kids in, in care through the Department of Human Services. And uh, ultimately, we, we find foster homes for kids who uh, are coming from families with potentially difficult situations. So today, um, we are here in uh, rural Oklahoma, here out fishing. And uh, we have uh, a special host today, Blake Shelton, invited us to come out uh, with some of our kids to, uh, to really open up the outdoors. Kids in foster care don't have the opportunity to experience some of the, the wonders of, uh, of nature and our, our natural world. So uh, we're so thankful for Blake uh, hosting us today. Um, it's, a, it's a collaboration between the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation and the Oklahoma Department of Human Services. It's called Fostering Oklahoma's Outdoor Families. You know, a lot of people think of Oklahoma as a, as a pretty much a rural state, but you'd be surprised how many uh, children uh, that live in Oklahoma that have never really experienced the outdoors because of their circumstances. And today was actually proof of that for me. Uh, these kids that came here today, a couple of them have never even uh, tried to use a rod and reel. And, and I think back to when I was a kid at, at their age, even the youngest, uh, kid that was here today and, and by that point I already had experienced fishing and knew how to use a rod and reel and they came here having absolutely no clue how to use this thing that they were handed. It was really fun to see how the day began uh, compared to how the day ended. They left here with this skill set and something that they're going to take with them and, and use and enjoy for the rest of their lives. I'm J.D. Strong, Director of Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. We know that uh, hunting and fishing is so important, so much fun. It's very traditional in the United States, but unfortunately, uh, interest is on the decline. More and more people move into the urban areas. They're losing their attachment to the rural parts of the state. Uh, they're losing interest in hunting and fishing. And the sad thing about that is it's really hunting and fishing and people buying licenses and buying that equipment that is what pours all the money in back into wildlife conservation. You know, I think because my parents were interested in fishing growing up that I, be, I became such an avid fisherman that the fishing led to the hunting. It led to turkey hunting, to deer hunting. We see a decline these days in young hunters, young fishermen, young outdoorsmen, because we're in a different time now. We're in the time of the internet. 
time of video games, a time of social media. Kids just aren't introduced to the outdoors and what that feels like to go out there and accomplish something on your own that is impressive and exciting and satisfying. Hi, I'm Rick Grunman, the Executive Director of the Oklahoma Wildlife Conservation Foundation. We're Oklahomans dedicating to conserving, preserving, and protecting Oklahoma wildlife, wild spaces, and our Oklahoma outdoor heritage for current and future generations. We are supporting and we have donated the rods, reels, and tackle for the kids fishing today uh, to help support the uh, Fostering Outdoor Oklahoma Families program, which we're kicking off. You know, these, these kids today uh, had the opportunity to do something that they've never done before. I think if there's a message that I want to get out there to everybody, it's that it doesn't matter if you come from the perfect family or you come from where, you know, things aren't perfect. And, and no matter what the situation is, the outdoors are out there and it's for everybody to experience. And everyone is equal when it comes to the outdoors and their connection with it. That's the thing that, uh, that I hope these kids take away and I hope that they understand is that this, this state's resources when it comes to wildlife is, uh, it's at their fingertips and it's there for them to experience uh, every day of the year. And I hope they understand that and I hope that they take advantage of that. That is from pond to cooker. Blake Shelton's finest bass right there. You know, a day like this is the kind of day that makes me really, really be proud uh, to be a part of the foundation and, and to be a, a member. This has just been, you know, everything I could have hoped it would have been and more. It's just the beginning of, of what we're planning to do as, as a foundation uh, and you know moving forward from here this is a good way I feel like to kind of kick off the kind of events that we can do and just hopefully the difference that we can make help to help introduce people into the outdoors uh, this has just been everything I could have hoped it would have been and more we're excited to see this great program grow in the future Hey, coming up next, we're going to join wildlife biologists out in the panhandle of Oklahoma doing aerial surveying for pronghorns. fixing to start day two of our pronghorn antelope aerial surveys. Historically, um, there was a few vehicle surveys, but in the 90s, we started the aerial surveys. Uh, I want to say about 95, but they only flew about every three to five years. Um, whenever I come out in 2010, we uh, noticed that the population was uh, very unstable. And by 2013, we started doing it annually to make sure because we were wanting to allocate more tags for our controlled hunts and landowner tag opportunities for rifles. But to do that, we had to have a better grasp of our population annually rather than doing it once every five years.
we're flying transects east to west and we're uh, evaluating everything for a mile each direction. And uh, anything outside that, we plan on getting the next pass. We will start on the southern edge or the southern transect next to Texas. We work our way north. Um, when we do find a herd, once we get them counted, we try to make sure that they're pointed south so we don't count them again on our next transect. Our pronghorn survey is conducted in February when most of our pronghorn are herded up into large herds and focused on green wheat fields. This can be an issue because lots of times in February we have patches of snow. The main thing we are looking for from the sky is white patches, which is on the side of the antelope. That is why we conduct our surveys only in the morning hours because the angle of the sun is correct to shine on the white side. Using a fixed wing airplane is the primary method for most of our Midwestern states for evaluating pronghorn populations. A few states are doing some random grids with helicopters, but almost all of them use some form of fixed wing for these type of surveys. Some of them do half mile grids, we're doing one mile grids, but um, the science is backed through most of our states. We just located a herd of pronghorn near the New Mexico state line. Uh, it had a total of 41 head with uh, 17 bucks in the group. Uh, during our February population flights, we're only identifying the total and the bucks and does. We do our fawn surveys in August for recruitment issues. Transects three and four today. Um, didn't see much on three, but uh, four really uh, definitely helped. Uh, we saw probably about 150 animals, probably about 55 bucks, give or take. Um, with that, herds were averaging probably about 45 animals. Some years we get a lot larger herds than others. Uh, right now it's probably rolling with a stable population is what we're headed towards, but uh, we have a total of 18 transects in the panhandle to do annually. We do this flight in February so that the animals are herded up onto green wheat fields and in large numbers. The problem with February is we started out the morning at 16 degrees. Um, if we have snow, things like that, we're, uh, we're catering to the angle of the sun shining on the white patch on these pronghorn. If we have patches of snow out there, our survey is skewed because we're seeing lots of white patches. So there's, there's lots of factors at play in uh, having a successful survey. So we've had to stall a couple weeks due to snow in the past, but uh, this is the best time frame to get an overall population count for the Oklahoma Panhandle. Pronghorn is a very unique mammal, especially for Oklahoma. It is the fastest land mammal in North America. Um, they've been estimated at up to 55 miles an hour. And I truly believe that is possible when an airplane's after them. Um, they do not like any sort of aerial predator, I guess, because the minute we get after them with an airplane, they grab every gear they have and they are finding a way out. But what works to our benefit is they will normally get into a line 
and we can follow up behind them on this line to get an accurate count. A unique fact about pronghorn is that they are a horned mammal and not an antlered mammal. Therefore, they will not shed their entire antler every year, but unlike other horned mammals, they will shed their outer core every year, but there's a bony structure that is always there. So they are unique. They are in their own family, unlike all the other horned mammals. The Oklahoma Panhandle is a very unique place with very unique critters as well. We have a larger abundance in most of the state of black-tailed prairie dog. We also have mule deer, elk. We have some black bear, bighorn sheep, um, and even quite a few mountain lion sightings near the Black Mesa country. So a uh, very, very cool place. And don't forget, it's home to the pronghorn antelope. In April of 2020, a photo of what was thought to be a mountain lion in the greater Oklahoma City area caused quite a stir on social media. The very next day, we were able to tag along with our fur bearer biologist, Jared Davis, as he did his standard investigation. And although it was determined not to be a mountain lion, it gave us a great opportunity for us all to learn a little something. Recently, we had a mountain lion sighting report here in the Northwest Oklahoma City metro area. We take all of these sightings very seriously. Initially, our law enforcement division started the investigation here at the location where the mountain lion, supposed mountain lion, was sighted. They called me in that evening to look over the photos and we came to the conclusion that this seemed to be just your ordinary domestic house cat. The following morning, I came out to this site to take measurements, look for sign, and do everything that I do on a typical mountain lion investigation. Some of the signs that we look for in our mountain lion investigations would be tracks, scat, scratch mounds, or scent mounds that are found on the ground when mountain lions are present in an area. Uh, in this instance, we found no tracks consistent with a mountain lion. We found no scat or scent mounds or scratch mounds that are consistent with a mountain lion as well. When looking at the photograph, some of the things I used to determine that this was not a mountain lion were the size of the feline in question in relation to other things in the background, such as the fence, the trees, the height of the grass, and the homes in the background. So the size of the cat in question in relation to the things in the background led us to believe that this was just a normal house cat and not a mountain lion. Just to give you per some perspective, we decided that we would make some silhouettes of three different species of felines found here in Oklahoma. We have our mountain lion, our bobcat, and just an average house cat. Uh, we're gonna take these silhouettes and place them out at the location where the cat was in the photograph, just to see the size difference, if there is any difference, between these different species. So this is the location that we believe the cat in the photograph was located. I'm gonna place each of these three silhouettes here and then we're gonna, we're gonna go back down to the vantage point of where the photograph was originally taken and, and compare what the silhouettes look like to the cat in the photo. You can already tell that the silhouette of the mountain lion is much bigger than the silhouette of the cat in the original picture. Now let's go ahead and see what the bobcat and the house cat silhouettes look like, just to compare. As you can see from the footage, there is quite a difference in the silhouettes when viewing them from a distance. We have the house cat, the bobcat, and your average mountain lion. And when I say average, that puts it in the category of a small male to a large female.
If you have a sighting or what you believe might be a mountain lion on your property or in a photograph that was taken in Oklahoma, please go to our mountain lion reporting form at wildlifedepartment.com. When you send in a report, if there is no evident, no scientific evidence in that report, meaning you just saw something that you believe was a mountain lion, what we do is we take that information in a location, we mark it down, and if we have multiple reports from a single location, then we look into it further. If there is scientific evidence, be it a photograph, scat, tracks, claw marks, scent mounds, anything like that or of that nature, then we will come out, either myself or one of our law enforcement officials, will come out and conduct a site investigation to see if there in fact was a mountain lion at this location. Since 2002, we've confirmed over 30 mountain lions across Oklahoma. Mountain lions are considered a transient species in Oklahoma. This means that there's no established territory or established breeding population so far. Well, I hope you learned something with this video. And I just want to reiterate the fact that we take every one of these sightings very seriously. So everyone, please stay safe and go outside and enjoy outdoor Oklahoma. Well, I'm now joined by Jared. And Jared, you've got some pelts here to talk about some other types of visual indicators. Right, so in the video we talked about size differences and how to, and how to determine an animal based on size. But there are a lot of other indicators, like this bobcat pelt here, you can see that it's got a nice pretty pattern, some barring on the back, some spotting. But not all bobcats are the same, you know, they can be monocolor, they can have a lot of spotting or very little spotting. But what they all usually have in common is going to be this spotting and barring on the inside of the leg. And that shows up really well in a lot of trail camera pictures. Whereas the mountain lion, you know, it's still got that tawny brown monocolor, uh, monocolor look. Um, you know, another way that we, that we can identify is through the tail. You know, a bobcat is called a bobcat for a reason. It has a bob tail, usually between six to eight inches. Where the mountain lion tail, you're looking at three quarter of the length of its body. So a, a pretty good sized tail. Another indicator that we use to differentiate between species on, in photographs is the back of the ear. A bobcat has a telltale white spot right on the back of each ear with a black background. Whereas the mountain lion, it's just got that dark coloration, brown, blackish, with no, with no differentiation. So there are a lot of things that we can use based on the pattern and the pelage to differentiate between species when we get those, those questions from our constituents. Now you brought some tracks so that we can kind of compare the size differences too, right? That's right, and you know, there's a dirt spot right over there. We can go and just kind of look at them right now. Okay. So I was able to make some, some fresh tracks here, and I've got a mountain lion, a bobcat, and a coyote. So I used these silicone molds of a mountain lion, a bobcat, and a coyote to kind of show the differences between the canine, really the canine and the feline tracks, but we'll also go in to tell the differences on the feline tracks as well. So the biggest difference between canine and feline tracks are going to be the presence or the absence of the claw marks. Cats have retractable claws. So it just goes to, it just goes to show that they're not going to show up in, these, in their tracks. So as you can see, they've got, they've got the claw marks in the canine track, mm -hmm. whereas they don't have them in either of the feline tracks. But this doesn't show up all that well, but you can see that there are three well-defined lobes on the feline track. Whereas the canine track or the coyote track, it's got these two side lobes and kind of a recessed or non-existent middle lobe. Mm -hmm. So those are, those are two really good ways if you have a really nice defined track. If you just have a track you're not quite sure and there's not a whole lot of detail, you can just use the overall shape of the track to, to determine if it's a canine or a feline. A canine track is going to be more oblong or egg shaped around the edges. Whereas a cat track, if you follow that, if you follow the edge of your track, is going to be more circular. Okay. Now, if you're looking at trying to tell the difference between f feline to feline track or a mountain lion from a bobcat, you're really going to have to rely on size. Mm -hmm. you know, bobcat tracks get up to a two and a quarter, maybe two and a half inches wide overall track width. Whereas mountain lion, you're looking anywhere between three inches to five inches. So you really have to rely on the size. But those are just a few quick ways to determine the differences between canine and feline, and then feline to feline track. That's awesome information. I appreciate you joining me today, Jared. 
Hey, thanks for joining us as well. For all of us at your wildlife department, I'm Todd Craighead, and we'll see you right back here next time on Outdoor Oklahoma. Thank you.